right, we're going to be in the book of Jeremiah tonight. If you want to open to Jeremiah chapter 1, we're going to talk about a few things about uh, the man Jeremiah and his work as a prophet. So we're going to focus in on chapter 1, and then as we have time, we'll look through a couple other chapters in the book uh, to kind of look at what was going on and happening during his time and, of course, the, uh, the message of his prophecy. Uh, the book of Jeremiah, as far as books of prophecy go, is probably, I guess it's the one that has the most historic um, detail to it. The first 20 chapters of the book deal with events that were happening during the reign of Josiah and um, God's message to the people at that time. And so it's a lot like um, Zephaniah. God used uh, Jeremiah to let the people know that um, their heart was given to idolatry, even though the kings were trying to reform their actions. So they were doing things different outwardly, but their hearts, in their hearts, they were still uh, worshiping idols. And so it was only an outward show. It wasn't a real repentance and a true change that was um, taking place. But because of that message, and you remember Josiah was a good king who was trying to lead that kind of reform in the land. Um, he wanted people to change their hearts. But you can't force people to do that, of course, so he was trying to change the outward things. Uh, but Jeremiah is preaching at that same time, and because of that, um, his work as a prophet was very difficult, and his life was filled with great sorrow because of that. We often call Jeremiah the weeping prophet because he, he cries a lot in his, in his book. Um, and, of course, he also wrote the book of Lamentations, and Lamentations means weeping or crying. Uh, but he's crying over the lost condition of his people, that they're headed you know, to a destruction that, uh, for whatever reason, they won't accept the truth about. And all he can do is to try to warn them, but he sees the direction that his nation was headed, and uh, it broke his heart. And so there's some interesting things about him that we learn from this book. So if you look at chapter 1, verse 1, starting there, it says the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 30th, uh, 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. And so we learn some things about Jeremiah here. First of all, his name, Jeremiah, means appointed by Jehovah, or maybe more literally raised up by Jehovah. And so God appointed Jeremiah. He raised him up to this purpose of being this preacher of truth during this uh, time of, of Judah's history. Uh, sometimes people render it as instead of raised up by Jehovah as Jehovah will rise. And sometimes you can do that with names, kind of reverse it that way. And so maybe it, it has that meaning, but it seems like it's indicating that Jeremiah was a man specifically chosen by God for this role. Uh, much like, you know, Jesus chose Saul on the road to Damascus. And when he was converted and, and you know, God had a very specific work for him. The same is true of um, Jeremiah. He's called the son of Hilkiah. Hilkiah means Jehovah is my portion. And when back in 2 Kings chapters 22 and 23, there is a priest who was named Hilkiah, and it seems like in those chapters he was serving as high priest. And so it's possible that that was Jeremiah's father because Jeremiah is of the priestly uh, family. It says in verse 1, of the priests that were in Anathoth. And so he was a priest. His dad would have been a priest also. And it's possible that that's the same um, Hilkiah. So he may have been the son of the high priest, uh, but we can't, you know, say that conclusively. The Bible doesn't say it, you know, directly like that. But it's very possible. And one other interesting thing is, is that it seems like Josiah the king and Jeremiah were very close in age. 
And so they were, you know, not just working at the same time contemporary, but they were probably very similar in age and they'd had very similar experiences in Jerusalem growing up and, and those things and seeing the direction of, of the nation. So the town of Anathoth was about three miles northeast of Jerusalem and that's where Jeremiah was uh, from. We're told that he began prophesying in the 13th year of Josiah's reign and that was one year after Josiah started his reforms. So that had been going on for a year when Jeremiah began to preach and he continued uh, through the reigns of those other kings that are mentioned in verse 3, Jehoiakim and then Zedekiah, all the way to the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon. So some 40 years after Jeremiah starts prophesying is when Jerusalem fell and Judah fell to the Babylonians. So contemporary to Jeremiah were Zephaniah, Nahum, and Habakkuk, all of whom we've, we've studied, and then there was Daniel and Ezekiel, and we'll get to them. Uh, Daniel, of course, is taken into captivity, and uh, later Ezekiel is also. And so God has prophets in captivity and Jeremiah back in, back in Jerusalem. So that's just kind of some background information about Jeremiah himself. But notice what we're told in verse 4. And this is the record of God's calling Jeremiah to this work. It says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, that shalt thou speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Now pause there and let's talk a little bit about um, what happens here. First of all, we learned that before Jeremiah was um, born, obviously, but even more specifically, before he was conceived in the womb of his mother, um, God already knew him and had a plan for him. God planned for Jeremiah to be a prophet. And that doesn't mean that Jeremiah had no choice in the matter, that he had to do this and there was no option. He still had free will and he could choose to accept or to reject what God wanted of him. But what he is being told and what God is you know, informing him is that you are the person that I have chosen for this work and you're, you're the one to do it. And uh, so with God you know, telling him that, Jeremiah um, obviously wants to. He doesn't have a lot of confidence in himself, but he wants to serve God and to be faithful uh, to him. I think it's important to notice here also, of course, that God knew this before he formed him uh, in the womb of his mother, and then before he says, thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, I set thee apart, and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. You know, on Sunday we talked about the, the virgin birth of Jesus and how, um, you know, while he was in the womb of his mother, he was already Jesus. Right? The whole notion of abortion not being murder, not ending a life of a human being um, is against everything that the Bible teaches. Uh, Jesus was Jesus in the womb. Jeremiah was Jeremiah in the womb. And had something happened and that, you know, people want to call it an embryo or a clump of cells or whatever, if it had died, there would have been no Jeremiah. There would have been no Jesus because that was a person in the womb and it's clear it's obviously clear in scripture and it's clear just in you know logical reasoning that life is is life and it's sad that so many you know refuse to see that or fail to see that uh, but the bible makes it clear you know that that's life in the womb and so god already had plans for jeremiah and so when jeremiah learned about this of course he said i'm a child um, 
not that he was literally a child, but he was uh, young and, of course, inexperienced. He didn't feel mature enough or strong enough to be able to do this work that God wanted him to do. And, but notice what God says, and this is important to remember, that God says, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, that uh, thou shalt speak. And so God says, you know, don't use that as an excuse to try to keep yourself from doing this work. It's not about you, Jeremiah, and it's not about your experience, and it's not about your age. It's about the fact that I, God, can use you if you will trust me and if you will um, let me. And so when it comes to our excuses uh, from doing God's work, you know, we're, we're good at making them, but we need to know that God's answer would be, you know, don't say that. Don't make that excuse, uh, but just do what, what God asks us to do, what we're supposed to do. And so Jeremiah, you know, was humble in the sense that um, he recognized his immaturity or his lack of experience, uh, but humility should never be an excuse for obeying God. And sometimes we do that when we think about evangelizing. Well, I can't go and talk to somebody. You know, who am I to have a Bible study with, with someone? Well, that's just an excuse. If God is with us, then we can, we can do what he tells us to do, or he wouldn't have told us to do it. And so it's good to be humble and to recognize, you know, when we don't know and that we need to learn and grow, but then we need to learn and grow and not let that be an excuse to keep us from doing what God wants us to do. And so it didn't work with Moses. It doesn't work with Jeremiah here uh, either. Instead, God encourages him, tells him that he would uh, be with him and he would protect him. And then he touched Jeremiah's mouth. And symbolically, of course, he was putting his words, God's words, into Jeremiah's mouth. So this is a picture of inspiration. And what inspiration is, is that when a man spoke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the words that came out of his mouth were God's words, not his own. And that's the Bible doctrine of inspiration. So when we read scripture, we're not reading the words of Jeremiah, even though he might have written them, or as it seems to be the case, he dictated it to his scribe, Baruch, and Baruch wrote those words. They're not Jeremiah's words, and they're not Baruch's words, they're God's words. And that was the, the power and the means of um, inspiration. And so God gives him his words, and so when Jeremiah speaks, he's going to speak God's word. And then notice what his mission was. Uh, in verse 10, it was, first of all, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down. And then, after that, to build and to plant. And so the ultimate goal was to build, right, to make better and to make stronger. But oftentimes before you can build, you have to tear down what's there previously. And so if you're going to, you know, build on to a house or whatever and you've got a, a rotten foundation, you have to take that out and rebuild the foundation and then you can build onto your house. Well, Judah had a lot of rottenness, a lot of things that needed to be removed from their thinking and from their, their practice, and that needed to be corrected, and then you could start building on that. It's like that so often when we talk with our friends in the religious world. Before we can sometimes talk to people about what the Bible says, we first have to help them tear down their preconceived notions about what the Bible says. So, for example, when we read our Bibles and we read about faith, we know that Bible faith is always trust joined with obedience. But in the denominational world, when they read the word faith, what they see is faith only because that's what they've always been taught. Everyone that's ever preached to them has told them that when the Bible says by faith, that means faith only. Well, that's not true. It doesn't mean that. It means trust and obedience, and, and the Bible's clear on that. But in order to show them one, you have to tear down you know, the previous uh, idea. And that's often the most difficult part. Unteaching is much harder than teaching. If you can find somebody who's willing to just say, you know, if the Bible says it, that settles it, 
that's an easy person to teach because the Bible is very clear. But someone who is ingrained in error and false doctrine, the unteaching is the hard part. But that's what Jeremiah had to do to Judah. He had to tear down all of their misconceptions and errors and false practices and then build. And so it's a challenge, and uh, you know, that's what he had to face, and we often do as well. But continue there at verse 11. He says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hands. So two visions that, that are given here to Jeremiah. And the first is a, again, you know, a symbolic vision of an almond tree. And uh, the word for almond, the Hebrew word here is um, shaked. Uh, it's spelled in English S-H-A-K-E-D. And it indicates something that is awakening or blooming. So you remember that Aaron had a rod that budded. And not only budded, but it produced almonds. And God used that to show that he had chosen Aaron to be the high priest. So Aaron's rod that budded was then kept in the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, that's, you know, background to this. Well, Jeremiah sees a rod from an almond tree. And God uses that to symbolize a blooming, an awakening. And so the awakening is going to come from the fact that truth is being taught. Jeremiah is going to tell people the truth. And that will begin to break down what needs to be torn down and then to build on that. But the truth is what brings the awakening of man's mind. And so God says, uh, thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. So God is declaring here that he will watch over his word. The word for hasten Remember the word for almond tree is S-H-A-K-E-D. Well, the Hebrew word for hasten is S-H-O-K-E-D, but they're pronounced the same. So the word sounds the same in both of these places, but there's a different meaning to it. So this word for hasten means to be wakeful, to be alert in order to watch over. And so God says this almond tree symbolizes an awakening for the purpose of watching over. And so God is going to awaken Jeremiah to watch over his word, to preach it and to teach it. But God is also, of course, involved in guarding and protecting his word. So Jeremiah's preaching is going to be truth because God watches over it and makes sure that what he says is true because that's what the people need to hear in order to try to get them to repent. And if they won't repent, so they'll know and understand why punishment and judgment is coming upon them. And then the second vision, <clears throat> excuse me, was that uh, a seething pot, which means a boiling pot, and it was facing north. <clears throat> and that indicated the direction from which, you know, Babylon would come to conquer and to, uh, and to punish Judah. So the last part of that chapter, verse 17, says, Thou therefore gird up thy loins, and arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city, and an iron pillar, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. And so God says to Jeremiah, you have a mission. You have a work to do. 
So gird up your loins, which means it's time to go into battle. So you're going to have to, you know, stand up and prepare yourself and be strong and be uh, an adult, be mature, and go and teach the truth in spite of what people, you know, say to you or do to you or how they attack you. So God says, you go and tell them what I command you. Don't let them dissuade you. Don't be dismayed at their faces. When they get angry at you, don't let it stop you from preaching. Don't let it discourage you from telling them what they need to hear. God says, you're a defense city, an iron pillar, brazen walls, all of those things. They're not going to be able to defeat you. They'll hate you, and they'll attack you, and they'll do everything they can to destroy you. But God would not let them do that and that same message is true to us today as Christians we are on a battlefield and we have to gird up our loins and be adults and be mature and step onto the battlefield and not let the enemy cause us to be dismayed no matter what they do we will never be defeated as long as we stay true to God and his word they can't defeat us because God's word is true and truth always prevails and so we have to stand just the way that, um, that Jeremiah did. So that's his call to this work of being a prophet. And there's a, a warning in there to him of you know, how difficult it's going to be, but great encouragement from, uh, from God. So in chapters 2 and 3, he tells us about what Judah has done and how they've become unfaithful. And it goes through you know, their sins and their apostasy from the priest and the Levites to the shepherds of the people and even the prophets. They've all rejected God. They've replaced him with idols, even though they you know, pretend to uh, worship him and to follow him. Notice just real quick, because it's kind of interesting to, to think about. In chapter 2 and verse 20, um, he gives seven illust- illustrations of the stubbornness of these people. So verse 20, he says, For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou saidst, I will not transgress, when upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest, playing the harlot. And so the first is the idea of an ox with a broken yoke. They refused to submit to God. He tried to put a yoke on them, and they broke it uh, off of themselves. Verse 21, he says, Yet I had planted thee a noble vine, holy a ripe seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? So God planted a good vine, but now they're bearing bad fruit, corruption of their purpose. God intended them for one thing, to be a light to the Gentiles, and they corrupted their purpose and became wicked. That's their stubbornness and their rebellion. Verse 22, for though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. So they were, there was a stain on them that even lie soap could not remove. So their sin had marked them, and there was no removing of it because they refused to repent. Uh, verse 23, he says, how canst thou say I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley, know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary traversing her ways. Swift dromedary is a roaming camel. So they would go in any direction for any reason, so long as they didn't go where God said to go. God says go this way, they're going to go anywhere else as long as they're not obeying God. That's their rebellion. And then verse 24, a wild ass used, uh, used to the wilderness that snuffeth up the wind at her pleasure. In her occasion, who can turn her away? All that seek her will not weary themselves. In her mouth, they shall find her. So a wild donkey out in the wilderness, where does she go? She smells the wind, and if it smells good, that's the direction she heads, only thinking about pleasure. So they followed their fleshly desires desires for for pleasure, and that's the way they lived and where they went. And then verse 25, withhold thy foot from uh, being unshod, and thy throat from thirst. Uh, But thou saidst, there is no hope, no, for I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. 
And so this is a persistent adulterer. Instead of being faithful to God, they've turned to one stranger and then to another and to another. They've loved their strangers, those who were not their spouses, and they, says, that's who, they say, that's who I'm going to follow. So they were devoted to, again, pursuing their lusts and their desires instead of pursuing God. And then verse 26, number 7 here, As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets. So they're like a thief caught in the act, ashamed when their sins are seen and are made known. So you have seven pictures there given to us of just how hard-headed and stubborn and rebellious the people of Judah had become. And this is what Jeremiah had to tell them because it was the truth. And understand that nobody wants to hear this. Nobody wants to be told that, you know, even lye soap can't wash away your sins and you are a thief caught in the air. Nobody wants to hear that, so they're going to hate him for it. But it's also telling them why God is going to bring judgment upon them. So chapter 4 then talks about how God's going to punish Judah and then chapters 5 and 6, the sins of Judah. But I want us to go over to chapter 8 now and notice just a couple of things here. Um, Chapter 7 is all about their religion and how it had become vain, how they were just going through the motions and thought that because they did certain things, God accepted it even though their hearts weren't in the right place. And so starting in chapter 8, we have the focus on Jeremiah's sorrow and, and his uh, weeping. So we won't be able to read all of this just because of time, but in verse 1 of chapter 8 down through verse 12, there's sorrow over Israel's backsliding. So he says in verse 1, At that time saith the Lord, They shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes, the bones of his priests, the bones of his prophets, the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves, and they shall spread them before the sun. And then he talks about the sun, the moon, the host of heaven, all of these that they have worshipped instead of worshipping God. And verse 3 says, death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family, which remain in all the places whither I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. And I think that's important, this, this choice. It's, it's always between life or death. And they, they choose the way of death. And we see that so much in, in our world today. We talk about abortion, which is obviously choosing death over life but it's not just that all of the you know the homosexual agenda it's about choosing death over life because you can't reproduce you can't continue the human race with that kind of activity so you're choosing activity that ends life doesn't continue it the transgender stuff is the same way not only does it you know in the same way it's death over life but it's also a, a mental kind of death that who you actually are, you're trying to kill off to be something that you're not. And just every way you go down that whole system of thinking with um, feminism and everything that undermines the, the home and husband and wife and being married and having children, you know, it's choosing death over life. And that's exactly what they were doing here. And the reason people do that is because they want to pursue their pleasures, right? And babies get in the way. Family gets in the way. I can't do what I want to do if I have to be a husband or a father or a mother or a wife. And so we choose things that end up bringing about our own destruction. And that's exactly what had happened in Judah. And so they were choosing all of the wrong things. You think about choosing to worship these idols. That meant sacrificing human life. They would offer babies as, as sacrifices to these false gods. God never demanded that. God promised them life, but they chose death because that provided a means for them indulging in the pleasures of the flesh, their fleshly desires. And so death became preferable to life. And it's heartbreaking and it's sad to see people going down that, that same you know, path today. I know we mentioned the Olympics, the open ceremony, you know, on Sunday. And again, people say all kinds of things about it. 
But it's very literally, I mean, if you look at what they were doing, it's not just making fun of Christians or whatever, but they are worshiping idols, false gods. Those ancient gods, they set them up and, and then bow down to them and, and make these offerings to them. And we think that's crazy. People don't do that today. We're so far beyond that way of thinking, but it's real. And there are people who do it and believe that there's tremendous power in those things. Because the Bible tells us that idolatry is connected to you know, evil, to Satan, to the demonic world. And they believe they get power from that. And in some ways they do, because they're obviously ruling the world. You know, Satan's called the God of this world for a reason. But that kind of way of thinking and that choosing of death, ultimately that's what it leads to. And there's no victory in it. But God will provide the victory. And Judah is going to learn that the hard way because they're going to be destroyed and taken into captivity. But God will bring them back and give them another chance at, at life. So Jeremiah is saddened over how his people have slidden back, he says in verse 5, perpetual backsliding. If you start in verse 13, he starts talking about the coming judgment on Judah. And again, there's sorrow and weeping. And then down at verse 18, notice what he says. When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. So I want to, you know, feel better and tell myself it's all going to be okay, but I just can't because my heart is, is weak. He says, behold, the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people because of them that dwell in a far country, is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with strange vanities? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black, astonishment hath taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? So we have this picture here of Jeremiah showing and stating how the people of God have drifted so far away from him that there's no way for them to escape punishment. They, they can't come back. Summer's ended. It's harvest time. And we're not ready. We're not right with God. We're not saved. So what do you do? Well, it's too late now, right? They're, they're cutting down the crops, and the people are the crops. Judgment's coming, and it's too late to fix it now. And this is, of course, a foreshadowing of the last great day of judgment when the Lord returns. It's too late to get right with God then. We have to do that now. So Jeremiah is weeping, and he's weeping because there's no balm in Gilead. Gilead's a place known of you know medicine where you could go when you're sick, and there could be healing but there's no medicine in Gilead that can heal what's wrong with Judah there's no doctor who can cure this wound God is the only one who can and he only can when his people will turn to him and turn away from their sins and so Jeremiah's heart is broken and he says because of the hurt of them I am hurt and he wept over them but there's nothing he can do they've rejected God they've rejected his healing they've rejected his truth and so there's only sorrow left chapter 9 there was sorrow over all the sins of Judah in verses 1 through 8 and then he continues in verse 9 sorrow over the fact that God has to bring vengeance upon them in verse 17 he says you know I'm sorry but people of Judah they need to be sorry chapter 10 there's sorrow over the idolatry and then verse 17, sorrow because they're going to be removed from the land. And then finally in chapter 10 and verse 23, he says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his, his steps. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that, uh, that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him and consumed him and have made his habitation desolate. And so the last sorrow there is this foolish desire that man has to think that he can guide himself. And it always leads man in the wrong direction to the wrong end. 
And so we like to think differently that we can figure it all out ourselves. But when it comes to spiritual matters, man is unable to guide himself, to direct his steps. We need the revelation of God through his word. We need correction. And Jeremiah asks for correction. He says with mercy, you know, not with God's anger, but correction that was needed. And so there's great sorrow because of that. And then lastly, chapter 11, three things. Sorrow over the disobedience of Judah. Sorrow over the certainty of judgment. And then at the last part of that chapter, which we'll talk about in our invitation, there's sorrow over this plot that had been hatched to murder Jeremiah. They couldn't take the truth he was teaching, so they decide they're going to kill him. And so we'll talk about that in just a few moments. But we'll stop here, and I hope it kind of gives us a picture and an overview of Jeremiah and the kind of man that he was and courage that he had to go out and to tell the people what God said, even though he knew they didn't want to hear it and they weren't going to like it, but he told them anyway, even uh, when it almost cost him his life. And maybe that will encourage us to uh, have the same kind of faith in God, to teach the truth, you know, no matter what, because that's our, our duty and our privilege as, uh, as Christians. But we'll stop here. We'll pick up with our next prophet next time. Two seventy five. Number two hundred seventy five will be our song of invitation. You want to open a song book there? Two seventy five. We'll sing that in uh, just a moment. We're studying about Jeremiah in our Bible class tonight, and he's called often the weeping prophet, and we were noticing some of the reasons for his sorrow over the uh, situation in the land of Judah and their quick demise and heading toward their own destruction. But at the end of um, chapter 11, Jeremiah found out something else that made him sorrowful. And he says in verse 19, I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. Because Jeremiah told the people the truth about their sins and about the punishment that was coming because of them, uh, they wanted to kill him. Uh, and so they came up with this plan to, uh, to murder uh, Jeremiah. And it was made known to him. God made sure that he uh, found out about it. And... It was um, heartbreaking to him 
that the people, his own people, would hate him just for telling them the word of God. But it became even more heartbreaking when he found out, verse 21, uh, thus saith the Lord of the men of Anathoth that seek thy life. The people who were trying to kill Jeremiah were from his own hometown. It was the people that he had grown up with, that had known him since he was a, a young man. The people, and Jeremiah was a priest. He was of the priestly tribe, and, and a priest, his father was a priest. So Anathoth was a priestly town. The whole town was made up of priests, and they were the ones who wanted to kill him because he was telling the people the truth. There was another plot later on in chapter 18 to kill him, and then when you come to chapter 20, we read this in verse 1. Now Pasher, the son of Imer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. So they didn't kill him, but this guy, you know, punched him, knocked him out or whatever, and had him arrested and locked in the stocks just for telling people the truth, preaching the word of God. And Jeremiah says to him in verse 3 that uh, the Lord has not called thy name Pasher, but Megor Misabib. And what he means is Pasher is a name that meant security on every side. And Jeremiah changed it to fear on every side. Instead of being surrounded by security, he says, God says you're surrounded by terror. And God says that he's going to die or be taken into captivity along with his family uh, and all of those things. And those are just the beginnings of the persecutions of, of Jeremiah. And so he was a weeping prophet because he was watching the downfall of his nation. He was watching the people of God abandon God and lead themselves to their own destruction. He himself was trying to tell them the truth and help them and warn them. And so they were turning against him and attacking him. But then above all of that, in chapter 20, down at verse number 7, he says this. He says, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. So Jeremiah says, you didn't tell me the truth, God. I was just doing your will and teaching your word and preaching your message. And every day, everybody that I meet hates me and mocks me and ridicules me and punishes me. And they do all these things to me. And, of course, he didn't mean that God actually deceived him because God told him at the beginning, we talked about tonight, how this was going to be and that he wouldn't be accepted. But Jeremiah's overcome, you know, with being seemingly the one man trying to tell people the truth and he's hated by everyone and so he says every day I am reproached and derided so he says in verse 9 then I said I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay Jeremiah said, things got so bad, I decided I'm just done. I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm not going to talk about God. I'm not going to tell people his will. But he couldn't stop. God's word is like that. It's a fire in our bones, or at least it ought to be, so that when we see sin, we can't help but speak out. When we hear God ridiculed and blasphemed, we can't help but stand up and defend him. That's how it was with Jeremiah. Even though he suffered so terribly, he would not and could not stop telling people the truth. And that's the kind of people we need to be as children of God today. That no matter what someone may do to us or say about us or try to turn people against us or whatever, if we have to suffer even the way that Jeremiah did, we need to tell people the truth about what God's word says because it's the only way that they can be saved from their sins. And that may not be important to them at that, that moment when we're talking to them, but there is a time when it will be. And they need to have at least have had the opportunity to hear the truth. And that's what we have to do to be that kind of person 
that Jeremiah was. In the New Testament, the great example of that, of course, is Jesus. And I'm going to close with this in Matthew 23, that Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, but Jesus also wept. And not just at the grave of Lazarus. When we read in Matthew 23 and 37, as Jesus has talked about things that are going to happen, and, and he begins to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We learn from that that Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem, over what was about to happen to the people of God, because they had rejected God's word, and now they'd rejected his son. Their destruction was coming. And just like in Jeremiah's time, Jeremiah said, summer is past, harvest is ended, and we are not saved. And that's what happened for the people of Jerusalem. They waited too long to submit to God's truth and, and obey his will. And I hope that we can learn from that two lessons. One is that um, there's nothing wrong with weeping over sin, our own sins especially, but when we see sin in our world, it ought to break our hearts and motivate us to speak out, even if it brings persecution. But number two, I hope that will encourage us to realize that we can wait too long, that there's a day coming when you and I are going to leave this world, either by death or by the Lord's return. And if we're not ready on that day, it's too late. But our you know, blessing that God has given us is that we can get ready now and be ready when Jesus returns. And to do that, all we have to do is accept in obedience the word of God. Listen to his truth, believe it, and obey it. That Jesus is his son and our savior, obey his commandments to repent of our sins, to confess him and to be baptized for the remission of sins, to live the faithful life. And the beautiful thing is it's so simple that we can do it at any time, any time of the day. It's, it's so easy to put on Christ in baptism and if there's someone here tonight that needs to do that, you can do it this very hour and have your sins washed away by Jesus' blood and be raised to walk in newness of life. Or if you've done that and haven't been faithful to him and need to come back home before it's too late, if you'll repent, confess your wrongs, pray for forgiveness, God will forgive you. We'll pray with you, and we know that God will restore when we come in obedience to his will. It's so simple. Don't put it off. If you have sins that need to be forgiven, why not respond to our Lord's invitation? even now as we stand and as we sing.